Good. All right. I want to thank you, Anna and Henry, for joining us today for our next inst installation of the seminar series, uh, New Voices in Global Security. Uh, today, we have Anna, who's going to be presenting um, a co-authored uh, paper called The Struggle Over Anti-Coup Norm, Autocratic Norm Resistance, and the 2021 Coup in Myanmar. Uh, so Anna is Anna Plunkett is a lecturer in international relations at the Department of War Studies in King's College London here. She has just completed her PhD in the Department of War Studies, uh, where she was awarded an ESRC studentship for her project Opportunities and Obstructions, the Role of Local Elites uh, in Creating Subnational Variation Within the Nationally Led Top-Down Regime Transitions. Oh my goodness, Anna, that is such a PhD title. I love it. She holds an MA in post-war recovery studies and a BA in politics and economics from the University of York. And alongside her academic work, Anna has worked as a strategic consultant and human rights researcher with several post-conflict environments, building capacity and sustainability within small organizations. Her research focuses on the role of local elites as mediators and obstacles within national-led regime transitions. Uh, she's interested in how the presence of such alternative authority uh, structures um, uh, in, or, uh, sorry, authority structures impact community experiences and national political processes. Her work has primarily focused on the ongoing regime transition processes and localized conflict within Myanmar. She is presently working uh, to develop a comparative study of local leads within post-conflict regime transitions. So Anna is joined today by Dr. Henry Mertinen, who will act as her discussant. Uh, Henry is one of the leading experts on men and masculinities in the context of conflict and peace building. Uh, and he's currently, I believe still currently, a co-investigator in the Masculinities and Sexualities Research Stream for Gender Justice and Security Hub at the London School of Economics, Women, Peace and Security Center. He has worked extensively on gender conflict, transitional justice and peace building, including uh, the country of Myanmar, uh, for a number of NGOs uh, and international organizations. His uh, research is prolific um, and uh, he's developed key state-of-the-art publications on the subject and can be found in uh, numerous international journals and edited volumes. So I want to thank you both again for um, being able to, to be here today, a part of our New Voices series. Um, so the audience themselves, I want to also welcome you and thank you very much for, for attending and um, listening intently in an overcast um, afternoon in London or hopefully sunny wherever some, some of you might be in the world today. Uh, so the, the, uh, the format is going to work that Anna will now present for about 20 minutes. Um, sharing slides, and then uh, we'll hand the floor over to Henry for discussant comments and commentary before we open it up to you, the audience, for further questions or comments. You can either ask uh, live by raising your Zoom hand, or you can type in the question answer box and I can ask or pose those questions to Anna. But without further ado, Anna, I'm going to hand over the virtual floor to you. Thanks very much, Amanda. Right. I'm just gonna share these slides. There we go. Um, all right, so thank you very much for having me. So this is um, really a first reflection on the queue. So um, as Amanda said, I recently passed my PhD uh, looking at very much the local dynamics of, of conflict and democracy within Myanmar. And as I was submitting, so I was meant to submit in February, the coup happened at the same time. Um, and this really changed the way I kind of understood the country and I very much looked at this transition period. Um, so from 2008 up until 2020 or 2021, as we now see it, um, as to how into this relationship between democracy and, and conflict. And so this is kind of a first run in a, a currently ongoing paper between myself and Oshin Tanzi on how the international community has responded to the coup and how really it's facilitating um, the consolidation of the coup. So, so it's very much a work in progress and, and I'll be very appreciative of any comments anyone has. Um, and so this was a big change and in some ways quite an unexpected one if we if we look at the transitions within Myanmar. Um, and so really what we're looking at here is, is the question of 
the, you know, what, what is the question of how has the international community responded and how has the international environment affected the developments that we've seen over the last almost year now since the coup? And, and we're arguing that it really has enabled the consolidation of this authoritarian environment in the post-coup period and allowed the levels of repression and the levels of, of consolidation we're seeing within the Myanmar post-coup state. Um, so really what we're looking at is what's happening in Myanmar and to what extent can we hold the international community responsible for, for the outcomes that we're beginning to see appearing um, as we get further and further away from the coup that happened in February itself. Um, and we argue that in the wake of the Myanmar coup, there is a supportive environment has been created for this consolidation of authoritarianism within Myanmar. And this is achieved through a very limited and inconsistent application of the anti-coup norm by Western states and by the international community, but it's been further enabled by the sponsorship and protection by non-resistors, um, in this case authoritarian regimes, focusing here very much on China and Russia due to their primacy in, in the UN Security Council and as non-resistors more broadly. Um, but also, and I think one of the more surprising findings, especially over the last few weeks, has been the role that ASEAN has played in developing the anti-coup norm um, within Asia, which was uh, in some ways unexpected if we look historically at, at what ASEAN has been engaged with. Um, so this strategy compares uh, the strategic engagement that democratic non-defenders and non-resistors have engaged with, um, focusing on these kind of core countries and looking at the role of, of regional organizations in that, and also assessing what the implications for Myanmar going forward when we look beyond the post-coup period. So what happened on the 1st of February? Um, if you're unaware, on the 1st of February, the new Myanmar government was meant to take control of the country. Um, there was an election in November and this government should have started sitting on the 1st of February. And instead of waking up to that reality, what Myanmar woke up to instead was the reality of another coup. The military taking control of Naypyidaw, which is the, um, the parliamentary capital in the centre of the country. They arrested the main leaders of the NLD, including Aung San Suu Kyi, the very well-known kind of pro-democracy figure in Myanmar and had been the previous leader of the government. Um, and you saw tanks and, and the military really come back into the streets, both in Naypyidaw and in Yangon and, and in Mandalay and other main cities across the country. So a very clear uh, coup. And one of the really interesting questions when we look at the coup in Myanmar is the legality aspect. So the definition that I have here, you know, the illegal and overt attempts of the military within the state apparatus to unseat the executive is that this is clearly a military coup, and yet the illegality of it is under question, given that actually in the Myanmar constitution, there is an allowance for the military to take over government. And this is what the military used when they did take that seat in government, was to say that what they were doing was a legal maneuver to resolve issues of voter fraud that they had highlighted in the election, um, and that they would return to democracy soon. And this is very much in keeping with other coup patterns we see, that actually many militaries that come into coup um, to take over government do so in defense of democracy. Um, and that does not necessarily mean that we're going to see a democratic pattern afterwards. And actually often what we see instead is a turn to hybridity. Um, so competitive authoritarianism and other forms of, of regime uh, that really build on that authoritarian base that the military brings into power. And though there was a state of international outcry, and there definitely was after the coup, and especially after repressive measures started in the post-coup period, um, the new government has been able to consolidate quite strongly and really begin to build its leadership and legitimacy within the state, despite ongoing protests. And they've established the State Administration Council with Mint on claim, the uh, military leader at the head of that parliament. Um, and so they have claimed to legally take over the state and restore and claims that they will eventually restore Myanmar's democracy. So if we fast forward 276 days, which is how long it's been since the queue, you know, what are we seeing now? Well, we're not seeing a return to democracy. Those promised elections have gone further and further away as they've been increasingly delayed by the military parliament. And Aung San Suu Kyi and other NLD leaders find themselves under house arrest, remaining detained and going through what is considered to be a level of show courts or kangaroo courts within the state to try and impress. Um, the, the freedoms that were established during the previous transition period. So here we can look at things like the, you know, 
the numbers killed, we've seen quite a repressive response, but also most journalist publications have been shut down, freedom of speech has been greatly limited between media blackouts, the establishment of, you know, no, no real apart from the state media being engaged with. Um, so it's very difficult to see where we're seeing any kind of move towards or rest restoration of democracy within Myanmar anytime soon. So the question is, how have we ended up here? How have we ended up in a situation where a state that was democratizing has so quickly slid back into authoritarianism? And to what extent has the international community's response facilitated this environment um, and reacted to those calls? You know, we are seeing increasing calls from NGOs, both domestically and internationally, um, to bring an end to the crisis in Myanmar, and yet let very little movement on the international stage. So how do we understand that? And one of the ways we can look at this is through the anti-coup norm. And this really is, you know, since the end of the Cold War, we've seen this rise in the belief, you know, the end of history, that democracy promotion is, is the way forward, uh, and that the democracy is the only game in town for how states and regimes should work. Um, the promotion of universal human rights and civil and political rights, uh, all the way through to the really the establishment of, of this in, in charter, both in the EU, but in the Organization of American States, um, the US and other state policies on it, the African Union. So we see not only was it a norm, but we've seen it actually brought into law to be actually physically engaged with. And when we look at the response over the coup period, as highlighted here, uh, the number of coups has dramatically reduced in, in since the Cold War. Um, now, part of this is to do with the end of the third wave and the consolidation of democracy, but in part it's to do with this idea that as the international community has built into their charters the promotion of democracy, um, states have increasingly been penalized for taking part in things like coups. And so for things like the African Union, we see some suspension from membership if a coup government occurs. And so there has been a deterrence for cooing governments to, to engage in, in coup behavior. But this is only part of the story. If we look at why the international, if we look at international sponsors, one of the reasons we can look at how the anti-coup norm is failing or struggling to really take precedent um, can be highlighted in these two cases, the case of Haiti and the case of Egypt. In Haiti, the coup was in 1991. The UN General Assembly, the UN Security Council and the regional organization, the Organization of American States, all reacted very quickly in the first few years of the coup and eventually that government capitulated. However, in Egypt, when we look at a similar response Whilst the African Union did respond and suspend the membership, the, there was UN outcry, but there was no or very limited sanctions. And then the Gulf Cooperation Council actually stepped in, supported this new government and provided them the funds and capacity to maintain their power. And so rather than capitulating like we see in Haiti, we saw a consolidation of authoritarianism within this case. So we see how international responses can really dramatically impact the likelihood of consolidation to authoritarianism within um, post-coup countries. So one of the ways we can look at this, um, as Tansy highlights, is this, this, this contest or this competition between states that are putting on democratic pressure and states that are providing autocratic sponsorship. And so when we look at this, we can see there's competition here of how much, how important are these states and how much pressure or sponsorship are they willing and able to provide. So when we look at Haiti, we can see it was a constraining environment that the democratic pressure was very high and the autocratic pressure sponsorship was very low, and so the government capitulated. In Egypt, we can see that whilst there was democratic pressure, both from the international community and from the African Union, there was also high autocratic sponsorship, and this created quite a highly contested environment for the consolidation of authoritarianism within the state. So where does Myanmar sit in this, and, and why is this important to look at? And what strategies do these two groups use to defend their position? So what we'd expect to see with norm defenders or countries and states and international organizations that support democracy promotion and support the anti norm is we would expect to see them engaging in strategies of competition building. So that can be through supporting the ousted government or limiting the capacity of the coup plotting government. And that can be through signaling statements, official actions, embargoes or sanctions. Whereas norm resistors engage in a slightly different way, and so they look to limit this competition, to build the legitimacy of the coup government, to say that it is the core authority. Um, and they build that capacity of coup potters, and this can be financial support, signaling, official statements, visitations, or technical support. So what about Myanmar and what are we actually seeing? 
So we look at the international community, I would say the response has been lukewarm at best. Whilst there has been a UN General Assembly official statement and there was a lot of single cases of diplomatic outcry, there's actually been very little affirmative action or punitive action to actually condemn or really pressure the coup plotters to capitulate and to stand down government. Whilst the US has condemned the government, the sanctions have been very particular. So sanctions on only some military leaders rather than on the state more broadly and not really creating an environment that makes the government they currently have unsustainable. And the UK has done a very similar thing to the US here. They have condemned the coup, they have put on sanctions on military leaders. But then they also, and, and this is you know, maybe an unintentional consequence, is when the ambassador was locked out of the embassy in London, and they did very little to support both the ambassador or to really say anything about what the what that experience was in London. And so we can see there's almost an unintentional diplomatic failure that they legitimised the current government, the coup government, by not acting in, in favour of the ousted government. Um, when we look at China, um, so when we move to the non-resistors, we see a more kind of consistent reaction. China clearly uh, have focused on it. They have continued with their view on limited in engagement in domestic issues. So they did acknowledge the coup, which was kind of in, in its own way a little bit surprising, but the response has been muted support. They have blocked UN sanctions, as they have done previously in other coups. Um, they have agreed new trade agreements, but maybe not as much as we would actually expect given China's close ties to Myanmar and its vested interests. And this kind of shows that actually stability is the main priority for China, that they're kind of concerned about this government and they want to make sure that whilst their, their interests are defended, they're not overly supporting. Whereas when we compare this to Russia, we actually see a very different reaction. Again, another autocratic sponsor, another norm resistor, but they have blocked all UN action in, in Myanmar, and they've become a much more active and, and engaged supporter and backer of the State Administration Council in a way they hadn't been previously. So they've really developed their engagement with Myanmar, and this has included visitations to and from Russia, red carpet treatments, and high levels of signaling that we didn't see in the previous regime or, or previous periods. So Russia's really coming out as a backer and authoritarian sponsor of this regime. And so what about ASEAN? Well, historically, ASEAN has been not a very uh, quiet uh, engager on the anti-Kunom. Whilst they've tried to bring in democratic parts to their charter, overall this has mostly failed, and they mostly stick out of each other's uh, domestic issues. So it was expected, as with Thailand, that there would be very limited action by ASEAN. But actually what we see is they are engaging, they are developing um, some support for the anti q norm. In April, they agreed a five point consensus with the State Administration Council to limit that power and to see the return to democracy. And when the Myanmar military refused or failed to adhere to this, they then snubbed the military leadership in October 2021. And they were not invited to the ASEAN summit at the time. They would only accept a civilian leader. And so this is a major shift for ASEAN in terms of its policy for engaging with democracy promotion within Asia. And if we look at the cases we talked about before, before of Haiti and Egypt, this is a major change on the international environment. Regional organizations are a major part of the anti coup norm promotion and realization. And ASEAN up until now has not engaged with it at all. And now we're seeing some moves towards this. Now, I would argue this is a very tactical move for ASEAN as they are concerned about the stability in the region, but it's still a major shift in our understanding of norms. So what is the struggle for the anti norm? Well, we still see an in inconsistent international approach to its application, very much tied to interests and strate strategic importance. Myanmar is not of strategic importance to most Western states, and that to some degree accounts for the lack of punitive policies we've seen engaged within Myanmar. Um, the rising norm resistors, autocratic regimes have been increase their power, and we're seeing that with increasing action and openness about how they're gonna support new autocratic regimes within the international environment. Um, but regional, regional organizations do present an opportunity for realization. And so here we can see, you know, are we moving from non-contestation on the international stage to some level of non-realization on the regional stage that actually ASEAN is beginning to engage with the reality of the implications of the anti q norm. But for Myanmar, the outlook is bleak. The international environment is very, I would say overall supportive. There is high autocratic sponsorship, but there's also very limited engagement by non-defenders to support or try and build this competition at the 
local or domestic level. So we're seeing increasing op oppression, delayed elections, with very little limitations on that or, or punitive action. And the question becomes, is there crisis ahead? It's a pandemic. Poverty in Myanmar is very high and political unrest and violence remains. And so where is this going to lead to in the next you know, few years? So I think there is a strong opportunity for consolidation within Myanmar. Norm resistance has resulted in increasing authoritarian resilience within this post-coup government. And we are unlikely, I would say, to see the elections coming in, in those next two years as promised by the current government. There's very little incentive for them to hold them. Um, so the outlook for Myanmar remains relatively bleak um, in, in terms of understanding the anti-coup norm and its struggle in Myanmar. So hope that made sense. I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much. Great, we can have um, Henry just jump in if you'd like with any sort of comments and then yeah, audience, please do either ask live or hi Mervyn, you're here too. So Mervyn sure. live as well too. Um, yeah, but Henry, the floor is yours right now. Great, thanks very much. And um, I've got, um, I think five points that I wanted to maybe comment on and just by, by way of background. Um, so I, I've been working in and on me and Margot mostly sort of from the uh, kind of in looking at internal actors and working with internal actors. So my um, my view is more of one from Myanmar out rather than from outside in. Um, but I was um, I was wondering, first of all, the first point is, is around um, what you also mentioned, so the, the coup in Thailand or the coups in Thailand and the, the um, lack of any kind of real substantial inter international condemnation of that, and I mean, at best, a slap on the wrist if even that. And even though there is local resistance, um, local protest, there's also probably a silent majority who are kind of saying, okay, this is fine. Um, we can live with this because this brings stability. How much do you think that the Thai, the, the reactions to the Thai coups and, and their transition to sort of a nominally democratic but very much military uh, influenced government how much that was sort of a, a what what the top model expected as well that this would be the same way that their coup would go and how much they they might have miscalculated especially the local resistance to them uh, but also some of the international reactions for example from ASEAN um the second question is then around the other big actor in um in Myanmar externally, um, China, and if, if you want to comment a bit on sort of some of the other aspects of China's engagement with Myanmar and, and whether we see some kind of hedging of bets there, uh, especially in terms of China's engagement with some of the ethnic armed organizations. Um, some of them, like the United Wa State Army, have been completely uh, well, yeah, silent on coup and, and, and kind of uh, said that that's not, not going to be their, their fight, um, whereas others where China does have some leverage or at least sort of pragmatic working relations like the Kachin Independence Army have been very much uh, at the forefront of fighting in, in the north of uh, Myanmar. And, and how much of China is, the, I mean, China could do more to try and clamp down on that, but doesn't seem to be willing to do that. And then what, what your views are on what's happening there. Um, the third point, would be around the national unity government and mm -hmm. the, the Tatmadaw timed its coup well, so they, they didn't really become the, um, or didn't have the, literally didn't have the, the time to become the government. Um, but they are seen internally by a lot of people in Myanmar as the legitimate de facto government. Um, but for external actors, that's been a difficult sort of entity to engage with. Um, as they didn't get sworn in as the, the official government. And um, kind of from what I've heard from discussing with some of the international actors in like uh, the, the UN system um, and, and some of the donor governments, there is also then this concern that with its de facto declaration of war, the NUG has um, made us situation more problematic for outside supporters to, to engage with it. But at the same time, internally, there's massive uh, pressure on the NUG to declare D-Day and then finally start that um, concerted military 
resistance to, to the coup. So that's the three first points. The fourth point is, is about sort of um, how you would see um, sort of humanitarian aid playing a role, especially sort of with the, the worsening economic situation, uh, probable famines coming up, COVID-19, and um, so some of the attempts by various actors to maybe find inroads, kind of possibly similar, trying to echo so what happened after Cyclone Nargis with Bill Richardson going to Naypyidaw um, this week and, and kind of acting as a possible intermediary under humanitarian guise. If that is something that might give the Tatmada or the SAC a way out, sort of kind of space-saving way, or is that something that might consolidate their power? Um, and, and how sort of that might play out um, and if that might be a sort of possible solution to this. And, and lastly, question would be, um, you, you said that there's a strong case for consolidation in Myanmar and how you would sort of see then, and I, I would fully agree with you looking at, at the outside actors that there's no one really seriously pushing back, but at the same time on the ground, uh, the, the SAC has been unable to assert its authority and its, its legitimacy is very close to nil internally. And, and the, the local PDFs, the, the, the ethnic armed group, uh, are increasingly making it impossible for the local governance structures to function. And then and CDM's probably waning with the civil disobedience movement, but that's really also hampered the governance uh, possibilities of governing the country for the SAC and whether or not this might lead to a position where then the facts on the ground, as messy as they are, might lead to a, might force the SAC to, to back down in one way or another. But thanks again for this presentation and thanks for having me as a discussant and yeah, looking forward to, to discussing more. Happy Feast Game, Amanda. Yeah, cool. Um, so yeah, I think I mean on on the the Thailand point. I mean, I, I I've been in me I've been in Thailand for I think two of the most recent coups, and it's like the TV goes green for a while, and you're like, oh, cool, another coup, Great. wonderful. And it is if, unless you're in the capital, it's very just like, oh yeah, this is just you know. I think the, the most we've ever I've ever seen a disruption to to life in Thailand with the coup was was you can't go close to the border anymore where we were working. Um, and I think, yeah, that has very much defined how coups are seen in ASEAN. I think that's a really good point. Um, and I think uh, that we could say that that's, you know, in some ways part of why the Tamdor miscalculated maybe the domestic response. But I think also, I mean, if we look at Myanmar's history itself and the coups that Myanmar has experienced in the past, I mean, there's always been a very strong opposition to military government in Myanmar, a very strong belief in political protest and engaging in street protests. So I think they will have known that that was a likely thing to happen. Um, and I think when we talk about, you know, timing, it was a very well-timed coup, you know, it was the day that they were meant to sit, so they didn't become legitimized, but also it happened at a time when there was a pandemic, there was, you know, when we talk about the building of Napidor and the isolation of the capital, um, there is a lot there to suggest that, you know, this was a very strategic move, both both long term and, and short term. Um, so I think there, there was a miscalculation there in terms of how maybe the international community would respond and, and how it be seen, um, because it wasn't just easily done for it. And then ASEAN certainly haven't sat down and just, just allowed Myanmar to get on with it. Um, but at the same time, I think there is a historical precedent for going out on the streets and really protesting when the military decides to overstep its boundaries and, and leave barracks. Um, and I think, uh, I think an expectation that that wouldn't happen is unrealistic. I think it's more that they knew this was a good opportunity given the international environment around COVID, given the government hadn't been legitimized yet, given how it was going to go if, if the new government came in and, and the space they would sit in. So I, th I think there was a miscalculation to some degree, but I don't think it was that much about that expectation on Thailand. I, I think it's about ASEAN. I think it's about, you know, they, they timed it not so they didn't have domestic protests. I think they always expected those. I think they hoped that COVID would limit them. And I think they hoped that COVID would limit the likelihood of intervention or interaction by the international community. Um, on point one, did that answer your question? Yeah. Um, 
China's a really interesting one. Um, I think, you know, especially when we get into looking at the borderlands and when we first started talking about the Kyoto, you know, there's, there's two storylines. When we look at Myanmar, we always have to remember there's two storylines. There's what's happening in Rangoon and Naypyidaw and, and the central states, and then there's what's happening in the borderlands. And they don't, they don't match up. Um, and they very rarely agree with one another. And we can see that with organizations like the KIO and like the United West, West State Army, but very limited engagement with what's happening in the central state. Um, but we can also, what we can see is a major increase in violence in these areas that the Taliban have not been limited anymore by a civilian government, and they have really gone for it, especially in Northern Shan State. I mean, the situation in Northern Shan State is dire, and that has increased dramatically since the start of the coup. Um, whilst it was building there, it's definitely gone over, and it's, it's been very upsetting to watch, watch that kind of happen over the last kind of you know, six months, that, that return to violence that has been, whilst the NCA was very limited, I think, um, you know, it did stop a lot of the direct violence by now then. Um, but now we see this kind of engagement in this very violent, uh, very direct policy. Um, and China's engagement in that, I think, is very interesting because obviously China's been seen as a partner for both funding international organisations but also, um, sorry, the funding that the military regimes or, or the uh, local elites within Myanmar, especially when they're not happy with Yangon, um, and we've definitely seen that, but when Yangon hasn't done what China's wanted, new funding has come in to places like the United World State Army. Um, so I think China's strategy this whole time has been stability and capacity. It does not want increased violence on its borders. It wants its investment projects. A lot of its electricity for the West is based in Myanmar. It's signed I, a load of memorandums the year before the coup happened so i think there is incentive there to they will support the new government if the new government is able to deliver on the financial investment that china has made if myanmar's current government is unable to secure that i think china's you know its, it's whole aim is to, to make sure it's it's network towards the indian ocean is secured um, so I think I think it's you know that variable relationship that China's always had with Myanmar, which is tacit support, but underlined with this idea that on, on the delivery of, of certain objectives. And if that comes into threat, then I think that relationship will, will fall apart as it has done in the past. Um, on your point on um, the national unity government, I, yeah, I mean I think this is a major issue, isn't it? Like that, that what's happening domestically and the support for the NUG domestically in terms of that government has now been sitting for nine months. They have an online government. Um, they did do a swearing in ceremony and they are seen as legitimate in large parts, if not all of, of Myanmar, but from, from the civilian point of view versus the international community who seem to not engage with them at all or don't see them as legitimate. And I think this goes back to the pressure that the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi faced during the previous transition period, which is what the domestic community wants and what the domestic audiences want and what the international community want to see are completely different things. And so trying to please both of these audiences is very difficult when they don't have full control of the government. They didn't have full control of the government during the transition period and they definitely don't have control of the government now. And so we're stuck in a situation where, you know, I think a lot of, you know, they don't want to go to war. I think they want to focus on democratizing. They want to focus on building the capacity of Myanmar state. And yet what the domestic audiences want or and someone's need to see it, is, is this legitimization this push against the military because what they want from democracy is the end of military rule um, and so then we see that this push towards having a more federalized government um, and a more federalized military having a, having that federal army having the pdfs engaged retraining so that the only military they have is not the military that keeps taking over the government um, so i think i think the nug is stuck in a very difficult position of how best to to legitimize do they focus on domestic or do they focus on the international? And I, I think they feel, or it, it definitely seems from, from the people I've been speaking to, that, that they don't feel like the international community is listening to them. And I mean, to be fair, the, the evidence for the international community is, is pretty poor at this point for the, for the NUG. And I think that is that is in some ways an error on, on the international community's point. This government had been elected, had been ready to be sworn in, and it's made up predominantly of people who were in government before. Um, so I think there is an issue there and it shows this issue around this legality issue of like what is an ousted government, where do they sit, and I mean this this always goes back and I think you know the more you talk to the domestic people the more you have this issue and this is exactly like 1988 all over again um, and the frustrations that that has built between the domestic audiences and the international community. Um, 
uh, on the issue of the humanitarian, I mean, yeah, as I said, like, you know, we know Myanmar is heading towards quite a serious crisis. The, the, the level of poverty, especially in Yangon, where the protests have meant there's been very little um, industry over the last few months where people haven't been at work. It's major in the war zones where the, the humanitarian aid is now no longer getting through and has been needed for years um, is a major issue. So, you know, I think we can deny the, the crisis and, and the very... Um, concerning point we've gone to in, in terms of Myanmar's need for humanitarian aid, very much like after Cyclone Nargis. But I think what we cannot deny, I think watched Myanmar over the last 10 to 20 years, is the politicization of humanitarian aid within Myanmar and the provision of it. And we look at the Rohingya crisis for that and how long it took to get any international involvement in Sitway. And still, when that has come in, the risk that international community, you know, international workers have faced, the deaths we've seen there, the limited engagement that has been provided. Um, and then on the other side, you know, when we moved, when the most recent transition period happened and a lot of humanitarian aid moved into the center of the state to try and facilitate that movement towards democracy, it took a lot of aid away from the conflict zone where it's really needed now we're struggling to get back in and build that humanitarian aid and that capacity in those environments where people really need it so I think there needs to be a question there over you know both a short-term and long-term strategy because it is politicized it will legitimize the current government if we go back through the state and going through the state over the last transition period has left a number of communities in Myanmar extremely vulnerable um, and extremely pressured to come into the central state even with the military engagement and to legitimize a government that they don't see as legitimate just to access humanitarian so I think there is an issue there over we cannot deny the politicization of humanitarian aid despite the need for it. And I think that's, a, that's something that we need to tread very carefully over. And I know a lot of international community members are working very hard to provide the aid whilst trying not to legitimize that government. Um, but it's a very, you know, that's a very hard line. And at what point, what, what, when do we tip that scale? And I, I think that's a big question as it's always been in Myanmar during crisis times. Um, so I don't think there's a tidy answer there. And I, I don't think there will be any time soon, sadly. Um, and in terms of legitimacy for the for the for the uh, state administration council, I mean, I completely agree. Like they're not, you know, they're not popular within the country. Um, does that mean they won't survive? I think evidence would suggest from Myanmar's historical perspective that that has very limited impact on their survival. Um, the military has a very strong hold over the economy. It has very strong control over industries. And when needed, it can produce a large number of people to protest in its favor, as we've seen throughout Myanmar over the last few months, whether they are actually in support of the government is a completely different matter. Um, so I think, you know, whilst there is a grave question over the legitimacy of this government, I think there is quite a possibility that it will become consolidated. Um, and I think what's most likely to happen is what happens in a lot of post cases and has happened in Myanmar in the past, which is we will have the election, but the USDP will be repackaged. Will the NLD be allowed to, to engage in those elections? I don't know. Um, and so I think we will see another version of competitive authoritarianism, military backed competitive authoritarianism brought in that secures the military position, whether that be under a different title again. You know, um, you know, we've had the SLOC, we've had the SPDC, we've had, we're now at the SAC. So we're going to have a different version of the military repackaged. I, I, I don't think that would be a surprising result here. Um, the role of the ethnic groups and, and civil disobedience movements, I mean, have been very important and remain very important in really articulating the opposition to what is happening in Myanmar and facilitating that. But I think, and I think it will remain until we can come up with a, you know, the national unity government is working towards the issue of the federated army, is this issue around uh, the ethnic groups often feel like they're only noted during times of crisis. And then once we leave times of crisis, they are not important anymore to the broader public within Myanmar. And so this issue of that two story of how do you bridge that gap when, when actually they've had very different experiences of state throughout. Um, so I think, you know, are we, are we gonna see the uni unifying of those ethnic groups and the move towards a, a stronger opposition uh, to the central state in Myanmar, I think is highly unlikely because We've tried, well, you know, there have been so many attempts to unify the rebel movements within Myanmar to really build an opposition to the military as it is right now. And all of them have really struggled because actually these movements are very entrenched. They, you know, most of them are plus 60 years old at this point. Um, and they, so they, they build on their own, their own legitimacy there. And in this case, back to my own work, I'm like, you know, these groups, 
in some respects are built on survival. Um, so I think there isn't an, an opportunity for them to engage and they are engaging, they are training people, they are bringing people in. We've seen a surge in the number of people engaging in these ethnic armies, but is that gonna present a serious threat to the military given its size, given its capacity, given its entrenchment within the central state? I think it's unlikely. Great, thank you, Anna. I mean, I have um, a question. Henry won't be surprised where this question is coming from because it's embedded in my own curiosities too. Um, you've mentioned, you've touched a bit on political economy aspects of, of the coup and of, um, I guess, I guess my, my question around that, which is to be to probe a bit further in terms of the external actors you talk about, I wonder how does the international market and market-based actors play in influencing in, in your kind of your theoretical or conceptual framework of, you know, which way Myanmar is going to go, like we, yeah, as an external actor, how does, you know, market actors play? And then I just wonder, and this could be minimal, but I wonder um, what role, if at all, does um, diaspora populations um, in other countries also play in, in pressure one way or the other? That's um, so, yeah, just my two external actors to, to think about. Yeah, definitely. I, and the market actors was really, I think, a much, it's an increasingly interesting question because, of course, we've seen so much more aid and so much more international engagement in Myanmar in the last transition period when we really opened up and engaged much more broadly than we'd seen previously in Myanmar which has been such a secluded and isolated country so there, there's a big question over how the market's going to react and I mean Norway's Telenor just pulled out that was its answer to the problem it wasn't because the military was asking it to record to give information that it wasn't comfortable with it pulled out and I think this is this is the problem for it for Myanmar, a lot of people, a lot of organizations, I would say in, in a lot of ways, preemptively invested in Myanmar in the hope to sustain and build on that democratic dream and, and the development of Myanmar. And um, now they're stuck in a situation where the state hasn't democratized, it is highly military, it's remained highly militarized, and it's now a highly repressive, highly militarized state. And so do they hope that that ends that the, the promise of elections goes ahead and we have at least some form of, of competition within the state and, and some move towards a more civilly nice government again or do they pull out early on and then leave it and, and then we go back to the question that I think Henry was raising which is like at what point is that part, are we at adding to the kind of humanitarian crisis that, that could appear um, and so I think a lot of market actors are left in a very difficult position with Myanmar they want to invest and there's a big incentive to invest as well um, I wrote a paper on um, the use of genocide and democratization processes and how the economy was being used as the kind of carrot to bring the international community in and legitimize what was happening and, and kind of pulling a wool over what was happening in other parts of the state. Um, because actually Myanmar is highly underdeveloped, there's a lot of investment opportunities from a lot of different states and a lot of different organizations um, that if they, you know, it's almost as that last frontier and if they don't do it now, then China, then Russia will invest and that opportunity won't be there eventually um so there's definitely incentives to stay but then it becomes a question of, of how long and i think telenor is a really interesting case of like how brands uh, and international financial international actors are are making decisions to pull out and, and a number of the banks i know are considering similar things of how long do they stay simply to do with the stability as well so i think i think there's a, a big question over international uh, market actors in, in terms of Myanmar and how that develops. And I think we'll see more of that over the next kind of couple of months as we see whether these elections happen, because I think right now a lot of people are just waiting to see. Are we seeing the end of the repressive period and a return to some level of stability? Or are we going to see uh, another uprise thing happen? And if we do that, then I think more and more will begin to pull out. Um, and yes, where I think it's it's an interesting mix uh, in Myanmar. Um, so you have refugee diaspora in in Bangladesh, obviously, but also in Thailand. I mean, there's almost 100,000 Karen that have been in Thailand for a very long period of time, um, and Shan and Mon uh, communities there from the from the war zones um, on the long Myanmar's borders. But then you also have um, you know a lot of Burmese in in Singapore, in Australia, in the US, and in the UK, Canada, um, and they have been very uh, active in the support of the national unity government and really pushing 
for the international community to support and their countries to support the national unity government to understand the complexities of the conflict and and the crisis in Myanmar. Um, but with and I'd say sadly, but with limited impact. So that the funding is there, the support is there, and the diaspora have definitely been a very active role in, in terms of helping support communities and provide humanitarian assistance within Myanmar and, and funds to the country um, where people are struggling. So obviously a lot of teachers and doctors lost their jobs for engaging within the civil disobedience movement. Um, but the impact there is, is how long will that last? How long will the interest of either the international markets or the diaspora last in, in the reality of if Myanmar returns to authoritarianism, I think. That's interesting. I think also to um, just again, to push the market actors and then I'll be quiet, Anna, is, um, you know, there, we see there's a lot of, uh, I like how you describe frontier, right? Because there's a lot of um, interest in in capture, like in in security and defense technologies, right? Um, there's a lot of interest in being in these spaces as spaces for innovation in their own developing their you know various different defense mechanisms or whatnot. And I just wonder, you know, I think. So this is my, you know, political economy hat on is just the underpinning causes for actually sustaining this sort of crisis, right? Who is benefiting from this crisis and, you know, potentially looking at some international security actors who might have incentive for various reasons. And I wonder if, if you've looked at that or if that's uh, if that even exists in Myanmar. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we can, I mean, we can definitely see that with Russia, for instance. They've invested so much in the last couple of weeks in providing monitoring equipment, new innovative um, engagements with that, because Myanmar is quite, you know, the capital is very open about its willingness to kind of track its activists, to track the people who are, who are being outspoken about that. Um, I think the more interesting case is places like Facebook. Um, but which is highly used for all communication in Myanmar, uh, including interviews, meetings, work, anything, everything that's on Facebook, uh, news, whatever you want, uh, which was a very strange experience when I first went there and I was like, oh, we just use it for everything. Okay. Um, but it is, it is used for literally everything. And so that leaves market for like Facebook in a very awkward position because actually that's what's being used to track. A lot of the activists that's what's being used to monitor people and it's through the phones and it's through the internet that we're seeing a lot of this you know development of like the security apparatus coming in and really engaging so there definitely are people who are building in and innovating we can definitely see russia's investment is highly very much into security technologies um but i think the use of them is actually leaving other companies in a much more uncomfortable position of what do they do and how do they feel about facilitating these kinds of actions and, and the risks it leads them at. So I think, yeah, there are definitely uh, company as an investments that are, that are benefiting from this, this political crisis. Um, whether they will continue to, I think, is the other question, because at a certain point, you know, how, how much technology can, can one buy to, to watch and to listen in? Um, but also, if you have a, a more oppressive state, there is that political economy aspect of the black market in Myanmar was always very popular. And it was your frontier into Asia and to ASEAN, and that's continued. Um, the the drugs trade is increasing again um, along the borders, and, and so there is that element of the the war economy is coming back into play. That have always been in the borderlands, coming much more into the centre, both in terms of production, but increasingly in Myanmar, especially in Shan, as a marketplace. So when they couldn't sell the drugs, when just the drugs were in Thailand really built up more recently, the drugs market in Myanmar got absolutely flooded. Um, and so we've seen an increase in, in drugs dependency in a lot of Shan and Kachin communities um, to, have, to really quite disturbingly high levels. So there is definitely that incentives, um, but it's how that builds. And I think that's the problem that, you know, while some actors will pull out, there's always a new economy to pull into that, that environment and, and to really sustain and build that environment. Um, and as we see with China, like whilst they, don't, they do want stability, they will use the political crisis environment in Myanmar along those conflictual borderlands to their advantage to make sure they're getting what they want for the state. So I think you know, when we look more at the regional actors on the local level, it's quite interesting to look at how quiet they have been and how they have sustained this government or are waiting to see. And I, so I think it's quite interesting when, in terms of understanding that when we look, move away from maybe the big international actors into a more regional focus. <laughs> 
So I think uh, we have our audience that are sitting quite quietly. Hopefully they're absorbing in all of this really interesting um, information and discussion. I just, I mean, we're we're approaching the end of our talk and I just wanna, I guess, give the, the floor to you, Anna, just around kind of in conclusions. I mean, we're painting such a kind of a bleak picture for Myanmar. And I just wonder, you know, what do you think, given your research, you know, both on the ground, but more, you know, international focused, what, what pressure points, what sort of things tides need to turn in order for, you know, I guess, maybe a bit more of a hopeful future, if that, if you think that's possible? I, I do. And I think it, it is a bleak picture right now. And I think one of the things that sometimes gets missed out of these stories, especially when we're looking at the international level, is the resilience of the communities. Uh, they, these transition periods in Myanmar are very common, very normal. They've gone through multiple coups of multiple military governments, and they have always pushed to keep fighting for their rights, whether that be our version of democracy. But at the same time, you know, they want more political rights, they want more liberation. Um, they are high defenders of that. And I think what it highlights and what I've always felt when working in Myanmar is the international community, if it wants to aid Myanmar if it wants to work and, and to help Myanmar develop is that it needs to better understand and critically engage with what is happening on the ground in Myanmar because often what happens is it's treated either like another Asian country or like an undeveloped country and so I think it gives us the opportunity to really critically look at how we engage in complex conflict environments, how we engage in political crises and how we understand them because the opportunities are there to help sustain this government, to help build new democratic futures, to help build liberal policy and improve the environment within Myanmar quite easily. But there has to be the incentives to do it. And I think, you know, as Henry rightly highlighted, you know, the national unity government is there. International actors on the ground are there. And yet we're still seeing this, this kind of step away in this kind of, we need to delegitimize this military government but an unwillingness to then be punitive about it. And so I think at some point you have to make a decision. Are you going to tell them they need to be a democracy and, and really push that and, and penalize them and really take active action in that environment? Or are you going to say that actually, you know, there needs to be more support to what is a highly underdeveloped country um, and provide that financial support so there can be, you know, if we take the modernization theory approach to it, some level of development to allow these things to move forward more organically at home. Um, but I think to say, you know, Myanmar's a lost cause and no one should be interested in it, it it's, it's a very bleak way to look at it. I think Myanmar's, you know, it's the, if you start working on it, it's very hard to pull out because it's a very complex environment, but it's also one of those environments where I've had the most support, um, people at the communities are great to work with. And I don't think the communities on the ground, yes, they don't like the military state, but does that stop them having, you know, building their own liberal spaces, adapting their own resilience to those environments? Not at all. And a lot of my research has looked at how communities adapt dramatically to make sure that they provide the best survival and the best environment they can. And I, I really love that about Myanmar and, and Myanmar's communities. And I think that's that's true of, of lots of countries. So I think we sometimes need to step away from looking at the state and the state apparatus and actually look at how communities engage with these issues because actually communities live in them and live very well in them um, with the limitations that that state provides. That's such a great way to end your talk, Anna. Thank you so much. And I think, yeah, Henry and I were both nodding. I think we're all <laughs> nodding, you know, when, when a majority of our work comes from like um, on the ground everyday experiences. Yeah, certainly that resonates where you see the resilience, the hope, the, yeah, the 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 living a life otherwise, right? Then yeah. what, what, what the state kind of paints. So I want to thank you so much and Henry so much too for, for coming in and for, for discussing um, your research with us today. Um, so, and thank the audience for listening intently. I hope they are, you know, sometimes we can treat this as a podcast too. I don't know if people are cleaning or having a cup of tea or what they're doing, but you, you know, this was great to listen to. So thank you so much for your time, both of you. Thank you, the audience and tune in next week where we have a round table panel talking about transitioning in, out and up in academia. So um, yeah, great. Thank you all very much for coming and have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks.